Brother Rose has already spoken to us once, and this will therefore be his second time. He'll be speaking to us on what is the Unitarian slash Universalist Church. Again, for those who may not know him, he's married to Michelle, who's the daughter of Dave and Peggy Watson. He's a 2007 graduate of Memphis School of Preaching, and he's spoken in several places, states, Arkansas, California, Texas, Tennessee, and he is in Florida, currently preaching for the Central Church of Christ in Naples, Florida. I would say, suggest anybody, and sometimes this happens, people go down to vacations there. Uh, if you haven't visited Naples, it is one of the most beautiful places for a tropical type situation. Uh, they've got a good congregation there now, numbering roughly, what, 30 or so average. And when I was there in the gospel meeting, I was uh, glad to see it moving as it is. And I think they're a teachable group of people who want to be right. And they're willing to do what they should. Thus far, I think they've proven that and hope they'll continue to do so. So pray for him and pray for that work that it can certainly grow and develop and the brethren be faithful as they ought to be. So we're thankful Brother Rose has come our way. I think those of you who heard him know the caliber gospel preacher that he is. And we're thankful we have young men like this who, when some of us are pushing up daisies or in the trash heap somewhere, <laughs> that we'll be able to know that sound people are continuing the work of the Lord and that 7,000 have not bowed the knee to Baal. So let's give good ear to what he has to say. Brother Rose, speak to us. I'm indeed thankful to this congregation, to Brother Brown, the godly elders to have here for the opportunity to take part in this lectureship. I'm thankful to Brother and Sister Roth for housing me this week and their wonderful hospitality. I'm very thankful also to be with the brethren here, the fellow speakers uh, this week. It is indeed a joy to have such fellowship with good and godly men who are willing to stay, take a stand for the truth regardless of the cost. And so I am very thankful for that. I'm also very appreciative of Central Church of Christ where I currently work and for those good brethren there and their support of me even in this week being away from them and I am very appreciative to them and I suppose that the greatest thanks as far as another human being is concerned is I am thankful for my good and godly wife. Every gospel preacher that has a good and godly wife is blessed highly and in great favor from the blessings of God. And I am so thankful for her. What is the Unitarian Universalist Church, also known as the Unitarian Universalist Association, or the UUA, and that's what they call themselves? You'll notice this morning and in the manuscript or the chapter in the lectureship book that I did not deal with their past and the reason why I did not is because their present is so different from what their past was. And there's very little rele relevance in actuality. And so I dealt with what that organization is today. The world is full of people who allow emotionalism to rule their thoughts and actions. Emotive rationalization is strongly present in both secular and religious matters. I feel and I just know become the watchwords of multitudes. When called upon to show proof for their assertions, many will only give excuses smacking of their better felt than told platitudes. Their lack of logical argument and rationality only show how deeply they have been indoctrinated by the precepts of romanticism. I'm going to stop right there for a moment. That's also called romantic philosophy. And that is actually the under girding foundation for this organization and that's the reason why I'm going to start there is romanticism to understand this widely spread philosophy and its champion the UUA we need to begin to understand what romanticism is though the average citizen of the United States and throughout the world actually likely could not give an in-depth description of romantic philosophy the trickle-down effects of romanticism have in fact pervaded the very fabric of American life. 
The have it your way and whatever is truth for you mentality can be seen from the halls of our nation's capital to the beleaguered desks of social workers. Objectivity has been replaced by the subjective and the masses have been trained to cry, don't you dare judge me. Sadly, this grand rationality is seen as progressive social justice and peace engendering toleration. The clarion call of the salvation so-called of mankind through universal acceptance has found its way into the classrooms of college philosophy, professors to the courtrooms of our nation, the pulpits of enlightened religionists, and even into our own homes by way of the engulfing barrage of communication media which seems to attach countless people to this sea of false doctrine that is romanticism and its derivatives through so many electronic umbilical cords. The catastrophic danger of this movement of emotive mentality is its seeming innocence to the uninitiated. Now in human medical sciences, hypertension, also called high blood pressure, is called the silent killer. And this is surely an apt name for romanticism. Fear of being labeled as intolerant, racist, politically incorrect, or simply unintelligent and backward has pushed the masses to accept the subjective feelings-based doctrine as the model for the globally responsible citizen. And that's what they expect all people to be, rather than simply a servant of God. Tragically, acceptance has been easily won in the minds of so many because they sincerely believe it is just the right thing to do. And the religious world has surely not been exempt from the sway of romantic sophistry. Now, I want to notice some things that Brother Warren wrote about romanticism. He says this, This philosophy places emphasis on feelings. Now, that's very important. Even though two of these philosophies, empiricism and romanticism, seem to be at exact opposite ends of the pole, they really go full circle and meet at the point of agreement that morality and religion are nothing but subjective feelings, two sides of the same coin. Romanticism leans on feelings. It says, in effect, the heart has reasons which the mind knows not of. It says, one, that religion cannot and must not engage itself in a confrontation with the presentation of evidence from a skeptical world, and two, that faith somehow or the other must go beyond the evidence available to man by taking a leap into the dark. Romanticism rejects the truth that there is a relevant connection between evidence and conclusion. That is, by definition, rationality. It rejects the truth that explicit affirmations or statements imply what they imply is just as binding as the truth which is explicitly stated. Brother Warren goes on to say, those who espouse the romantic approach of a, a philosophy of religion hold that the heart of man has reasons which his mind knows not of. Now that's a repetition that we just had from the above quote, but that's extremely important for our study this morning. This approach entails both the rejection of the view that truth is objective and acceptance of the view that truth is subjective. We'll go into that in more detail later. This means that in view of such thinkers, truth is not something which has objective reality separate and apart from the mental states of the knowing subject. Rather, as per this view, truth is changed or brought into existence by the mental states of thinking minds. According to the position of at least some of the advocates of this view, the individual is absolute and whatever he holds authentically is truth for him. Or it might be said that they hold that whatever seems to be true to an individual is true for that individual. The basic tenet is be yourself or do your own thing. According to these thinkers, there is no objective or absolute truth to which men must conform in order to be in right relationship with God. Given this view, the espouser must reject the Bible as the absolute, inspired, inerrant, authoritative word of God, which, of course, it is. The espousal of this view leads one to substitute his own feelings in place of the scriptures. Now, these are all foundational things for what we're studying. This is what romanticism is all about. And so this view leads him to regard that those feelings as the only authority, used in a very loose sense, which he should recognize. Such a view has monstrous implications for religion, including morality. Oh, so it does. Once one has espoused this romantic approach, 
through the philosophy of religion, he rejects the scriptures as authority in religion and comes to regard his own feelings as the only authority which he will recognize. Oh, how true Brother Warren was. Therefore, for him, emotional experiences become the crucial thing in religion. And that is why the Unitarian Universalist Church is, in fact, a microcosm of the world, not a standard of truth. The follower, however, oftentimes unknowingly of romantic philosophy, sets up his own feelings and perceptions as his standard of law. Now, let's notice a few little points, short points from the new shaft, Herzog, uh, Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, and also from Cushman's A Beginner's History of Philosophy. There's longer quotes in the book, but here's just some highlights of that. One is subjectivity, and we've already talked about that, as being a principal tenet of Romanticism. Also, that duty was determined by feeling. The free unfolding of each personality according to its genius involved recognition and obedience of all individual impulses, inclinations, and even idiosyncrasies. And the theory constantly reiterated is that the genius of the person must be free to follow his star so as to give his artistic powers free play. They isolate single aspects of their own experience and develop these as if they were in truth universal validity. Romantics believe that reality is revealed not by rational thought, but by feeling, immediate experience, and spiritual illumination. The romantic individual has therefore a law, or was therefore a law to himself, dominated by unrestrained fancy, a creature of feeling and passion. Now we would notice these ten things about romanticism. Number one, emphasis is placed upon feelings. Faith involves a leap into the dark. The heart of man has reasons which his mind knows not of. Truth is determined by the mental reckoning of each individual. Be yourself and do your own thing are foundational to romanticism. The Bible is not the final authority in belief and practice. One's own feelings are the authority in belief and practice. The romantic is a law unto himself. Religion is sub a subjective experience rather than a biblical system of righteousness. And finally, subjectivity rules over objecti objectivity. Now let's notice the Bible in contrast to this false doctrine or false belief of so many in the world. The purpose of thrust of romanticism is that one believes in his own heart to be good and right and true is, in fact, good and right and true for him. More simply put, truth is whatever you make it to be. And so we would ask the question, does the Bible actually teach that? No, it does not. It does not teach that to be so. We notice now from Genesis chapter 1, just a few points here. God said, let there be light. Notice what happened. And there was light. Verse 3. Verses 6 and 7. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. What's next? And it was so. Verse 9. Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And you can guess what's next. And it was so. And so it continues on down through the creation of all things pertaining to the earth and finally man. We notice there in, in verses 26 and 27. In each instance of God putting forth his creative power, both the fiat of God and the outcome were objective and not subjective. One of God had said, let there be light, and a camel came forth. Now is that type of result Objective or subjective? Obviously, it's objective based upon what God had directed. God's power was directed and applied in a precise and unambiguous way. That is, the command was objective, meaning not subject to whim or subordinate influence. In a like manner, the results of the commands of God were also objective. Each command brought forth exactly what was intended. No substitution, no subtractions, and no addition. The outcome was not subject to anything other than God's objective commands. 
Now notice this from Genesis 1, 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, speaking, of course, Adam and Eve, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over that pile of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now notice also Genesis 2, 15 through 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, what thou shalt surely die. Wherein, in all of that that we just mentioned, those few verses, did God give leave to Adam in the above verses to do his own thing or to be a law unto himself? Where do you find that in those verses? It's not there. In what way was Adam's belief a leap into the dark? In every obligation with God, which God placed upon Adam to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish the earth, to subdue the earth, to have dominion over the earth, to dress and keep the garden, to abstain from eating of the fruit of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God was clear and to the point. Adam's belief was based upon the very words of God. Therefore, it was not subjective, but objective. Those commands had been given and in clear and comprehensible terms. Therefore, Adam's faith or belief was based upon objective truth and not mere subjective feelings. Now, why did I go back to the beginning concerning the creation and even Adam and Eve themselves, God's commandments to them, is it set the pattern for how God has always dealt with his entire creation. The entire universe functions in that form and in that way. And each one of us are included in that very pattern. God also dealt with Adam and Eve's sin in relation to an objective standard, and that is his own commandments. We find that in Genesis, excuse me, Genesis 3, verses 11, 16 through 19. The consequences of Adam and Eve's sin were predicated upon a thou shalt and a thou shalt not, as it were, and not upon what seemed right to the hearts of Adam and Eve. Now, please get this. Either before, during, or after their transgression. I'm going to read that again because I hope you get it. I hope you get it. The consequences of Adam and Eve's sin were predicated upon a thou shalt and a thou shalt not, and not upon what seemed right to the hearts of Adam and Eve, either before, during, or even after their transgression. Very important, brethren and friends, very important. God began with the universe and man in an objective way and such continued throughout the biblical record. Here are a few examples. Cain and Abel, Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 16. The flood, Noah, and the world, Genesis chapters 6 through 9. The sinful cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 18 and 19. The giving of the law to Israel, Exodus 19 and 20. John the baptizer and Israel, Matthew chapter 3. Jesus and Israel and all men, Matthew 7. Uh, 21 through 23, chapter 23, verses 1 through 39, chapter 28, 18 through 20, John 12, verse 48, and a myriad number of other verses. From the opening pages of Genesis to the closing verses of the book of Revelation, the Bible is resplendent, resplendent with God's truth and argument. He has never dealt with man in a subjective or varying way. Why? Because it violates his own attributes, James 1, 17, Malachi 3, and verse 6. Moreover, God's word teaches men that they also should be objective. Jesus commanded that we be perfect or complete like unto God through his word, Matthew 5, verse 48. Be therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. We are to draw conclusions based upon righteousness, John 7, and verse 24. We are to judge righteous judgment. We are to have adequate evidence for our conclusions. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. Compare also what John said in 1 John 4, and verse 1. Try the spirits whether they be of God. God's word is truth, John 17, 17. Spiritual nobility, also known as righteousness, comes by objective comparison of all things to the one standard, the Bible, Acts 17 and verse 11. Plainly stated, God is an objective being and his word is his objective standard to which one is to conform his life. We find that in Romans 12, 1 through 2. What about the consequences of romanticism? The consequences of romantic philosophical doctrine are truly staggering. As was mentioned before, Romanticism and or its derivatives begins in the classrooms of college professors and trickles down through society into the very homes 
of a nation. The United States of America is certainly inundated with minds schooled in this dangerous mental monstrosity. Every segment of society, from the well-educated to the uneducated, the wealthy to the impoverished, the powerful to the destitute, is affected in some form by romanticism. From the halls of liberal institutes of higher learning come those who wield great influence in politics, business, and religion, bringing this deadly, poisonous philosophy into their decisions and ways of life. Political agendas and social and religious policies are about the necessity of individual standards of conduct. This standard is not an objective standard, which is right for all men, but rather a standard that is determined as right by the individual in his own heart. And foul is the cry against any who dare say all against this type of belief. That includes us, brethren. Can individually determined standards be rational? Can one decide what is true and right for himself by using his heart and his feelings as the decider of truth? Can one rightly be a law unto himself? The Bible says no. Should subjectivism be the standard in light of reality and logical reasoning, one must conclude that the answer is no, a resounding no. There are four very important laws of logic and one definition that's central to our study this morning. First is the law of identity, and we have that both for objects and for propositions. The law of identity for propositions is if a proposition is true, then it is true. It's identified by that particular property. The law of excluded middle is for propositions, every precisely stated proposition is either true or false. And further, the law of contradiction. For propositions, that's what we're dealing with this morning. No proposition can be both true and false in the same respects, of course, at the same time. The law of rationality says that men ought to draw only such conclusions as are warranted by the evidence. And finally, truth. How do you define truth? It is that which accurately depicts reality. These are all very important things to know and to understand. Now, notice this about truth. If a pre precise proposition is or statement is true, then according to the law of identity, it has that property. Further, according to the laws of excluded middle and contradiction, the precise statement or proposition that is true possesses the property of being true, now notice this, and does not possess the contradictory property of non-truth or falsity. They cannot exist both together in the same thing at the same time. Unitarian Universalists do not believe that. In short, it is utterly impossible for any proposition to be both true and non-true at the same time. To insist that such is not the case is to insist that chaos and anarchy must and does rule and order and rationality have no place in the universe. Now here's an illustration. Suppose man A believes that doctrine X is true. Further, man B believes and holds the doctrine non-X, which is the contradictory of doctrine X, is true. So we have... Two men believing two different doctrines. Finally, suppose that man C believes that both doctrine X and doctrine non-X are true. That which is true and that which is false, as we might consider it. With this qualification that both doctrines are true, respecting the individual belief of each, each man. In other words, whatever anybody believes is fine with him. Saying that doctrine X is contradictory, which by definition involves strong disjunction, often understood as an either-or. And its contradictory non-X are both true is equal to saying that doctrine X is both true and false at one and the same time and in the same respects, which violates logical reasoning. However, when one holds that truth is subjective, that is, truth or non-truth, is determined by the vagaries of the mental ascent of the reckoning subject, then he must accept a logical contradiction and be, by definition, irrational. It should also be noticed that when one accepts... now. Please get this, that when one accepts even one logical contradiction, he must accept all logical contradictions. Because if one can be true, all the rest also can be true. What does he do if he though does that? He puts himself in what would be considered a double bind in philosophical terms. Well... He basically has no stopping point. This devotee of contradiction must believe that he is both existent and non-existent, at both one and the same time, that you exist and you don't. Now, who would believe that? 
Also, that he is both human and non-human at the same time, both male and non-male, both married and non-married, both a father and a non-father, and you just keep going on until you passed out because you've been talking so long that you can't breathe. Indeed, the consequences of Romanticism are staggeringly catastrophic. Such is the Unitarian Universalist Church. Now, I've said all of this to lay a foundation for anyone who will read that material and listen to it and understand it, that they could look at the Unitarian Universalist Church and almost immediately see the problems and see that they are irrational by definition and cannot truthfully have a reason to exist. And I hope, and we have already, and I hope it's continued to be said throughout this lectureship, that the denominational world does not have a biblical right to exist. Therefore, they must disappear, but they do not. All of the foregoing information was given to prepare us, and we've laid the precepts and we're about to lay the precepts and doctrines of the UUA alongside logical reasoning. And I'm going to show the logical contradiction. All I have to do is find one, and they're destroyed. And there's more than one and on just one point. Now, it should be understood that the foundational principles of an organization, if those foundational principles demand its demise, then it can have no rational right to exist. The foundational principles of the UUA can, prove, can be proven to involve logical contradictions. Therefore, its existence is reduced to absurdity. No rational person will accept, promote, or empower that which is absurd. Those who do accept, promote, or empower absurdity are seen as without ability or reason, without acceptance, promotion, or a following. How can the Unitarian Universalist Church continue? Only the irrational will, in fact, promote that group. I want to know some things from their bylaws and rules. And their information is relatively easy to get off the internet. Well, notice this. This is from their uh, bylaws and rules under the heading of principles. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenate to affirm and promote following. The inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, acceptance of one another, and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. I want to give you a little point. Do not be defeated deceived by some of these things that sound so sweet. We'll talk about that in a moment. A free and responsible search for truth and meaning, and that's absolutely key. The right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. The goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Respect for the independent web of all existence of which we are part. Now they also notice that the living tradition which we draw share, uh, share draws from many sources such as direct experience of that transcends, transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness, openness to the forces which create and uphold life, words and deeds of prophetic women and men which challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and tra transforming power of love, wisdom from the world's religions which inspires us to our ethical and spiritual life, Jewish and Christian teachings which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. Humanist teachings which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science and, er and warn us against idolatries of the mind and spirit. Spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions. Let me stop right there. Brethren, they are talking about Wicca, which is witchcraft. If you did not know that, now you do which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. Grateful for the religious pluralism which enriches, notice they said religious pluralism, which enriches and ennobles our faith, we are inspired to deepen our understanding and expand our vision. As free congregations, we enter into this covenant, promising to one another our mutual trust and support. As each section of the above selection of their bylaws a study. One must remember the overall context, and that can be summarized by this phrase, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. The UUA has devoted itself for, to protecting and preserving this foundational premise as free congregations we enter into this covenant, promising to one another our mutual trust and support. 
Notice the phrase, the inherent worth and dignity of every person and justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Uh, both built upon the phrase, acceptance of one another and encouragement in spiritual growth in our congregation. Worth, dignity, justice, equity, and compassion are all birthed by the universal acceptance of all people and their beliefs. The framework for building universal acceptance is a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. The quality of their declared freedom and responsibility is the right of conscience. And since each person is amenable only to their own consciences, they must exercise the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. Since objective right and wrong or truth and falsity do not exist, according to them, no lines can be drawn concerning the evil and the good or reality and non-reality. Therefore, they have the, the goal of world community and peace, liberty and justice for all. Furthermore, since the compulsoriness and even human identity are matter, a matter of subjectivity, they promote respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. We are no better than the apes. We are no better in actuality than the rocks and dirt that you find on this earth, so they say. Since no belief system is better than another, according to them, seeing that there is no objective truth and each system is just one part of the world community, all beliefs are just part of the living tradition which we share. As a result, this tradition draws from many sources. And so we understand some context about this group. And that, that exposes the seemingly diplomatic and gracious words, which are not, in fact, diplomatic or gracious. However, a change in approach now, we want to understand some things about these sources. They draw upon this living tradition. We're going to notice three things here. Wisdom from the world's religions, remember these are sources from which they draw, which inspires us in our ethical and spiritual life. Jewish and Christian teachings which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbor as ourselves, Matthew 7, 12. They don't quote that, but that's where they take that, of course. And finally, humanist teachings which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science. Now, what are they putting together? Heathenism or paganism, the Bible, and atheism. That's what they're putting together. Now, here's where we begin to see the problem with their so-called logic. Three disparate religious systems are listed. We just noticed those. Actually, four, considering the fulfillment and doing away of the law of Moses, Colossians 2 and verse 14. They are, of course, world religions. That includes paganism, witchcraft even. I mentioned that a little earlier. Jewish and Christian religion and humanism. All three are labeled as sources from which to draw a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Now, that's key. I've stated that at least three times already. That's very key in understanding what they're trying to show and teach. That's that guiding principle. Since something must be, uh, since something must be truth in order to be a source of truth, according to the law of identity, the Unitarian Universalist Church has declared all three religious systems to be truth. You get that? All three, they say, are in fact sources of truth. Therefore, they can be identified as truth. Now, if truth is identifiable and quantifiable, that is, truth can be distinguished from non-truth, and it is, and if that which is identifiable to retain its identity, that is, it is impossible that something can exist as both X and non-X, one and the same time, must not, that particular thing, whatever they say is truth, must not contain contradiction. That's according to the law of contradiction, and it must not. Then all three of these religious systems must not contain contradictions of one another in order for them to be right. If you can find even one contradiction between those three so-called religions, of course Christianity is a true religion, the others are not. If you can find even one contradiction between the three of them, they have been done away with. And so what are those contradictions? Now, the Bible, which is the source of the Jewish and Christian teachings, as they said, teachings can call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. And so they're, quote, they're using the Bible there. Now that's of particular interest to us because we're going to use the Bible to destroy all of that. 
And this should be apparent even to those who do not believe the Bible to be the word of God, even if they take it just as a piece of literature. So if even one explicit statement from the word of God can be shown to be contradictory to any of the other two religious systems mentioned above, then the contradiction has been shown. All I have to do is find one explicit statement in the Bible that contradicts even one of those other two religions, and I have won my case, but I'm going to do more than one. What does the Bible say about other religious systems? Let's notice Isaiah 44 and verse 8. The Bible says that there's no other God but the one God of heaven. Isaiah wrote, Fear ye not, neither be afraid, for I have, have not I told thee from that time and have declared it, Ye are even my witnesses. Now notice this. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. Paganism is God. We go on to notice Exodus 23, verses 23 through 24. For mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee into the, thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. I will cut them off. Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works. But thou shalt utterly overthrow them and quite break down their images. Again, idolatry is out the window. Now Exodus 20, verses 3 through 5. Notice this. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any uh, unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. And finally, Matthew 4 and verse 10, where Jesus says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. I found more than one explicit statement that contradicts what they hold to be truth. I've already won my case, but I'm going to go on. The Bible clearly sets forth upon these pages a dichotomy, that is, that they're on two opposite ends of the spectrum, between the so-called Jewish and Christian teachings and all, all other religious systems, not just world religions and humanisms are discussed here. And for all time, there's a dichotomy between those two. The contradiction is plainly seen. Therefore, the premises of the UUA are false. Now, what about humanism? We've already dealt with paganism, idolatry. Humanism holds itself in contradiction to the Bible. Notice this from the Humanist Manifestos 1, 2, and 3. If you don't have a copy of those, I would suggest you get one, but don't uh, read them uh, prior to or just subsequent to eating. I would, uh, you, you may become sick at your stomach. Now, these manifestos depict theism as outdated and the supernatural, that is God, as antiquated. Notice this. From Manifesto 1, humanism asserts that the nature of the universe depicted by modern science makes unacceptable any supernatural or cosmic guarantees of human values. We are convinced that the time has passed for theism, that's God, deism, modernism, and several varieties of new thought. Now, Manifesto 2, as in 1933, humanists still believe that traditional theism, that's belief in the Bible, especially faith in the prayer hearing God, assumed to love and care for persons, to hear and understand their prayers, and to be able to do something about them is an unproved and outmoded faith. Salvationism, based on mere affirmation, still appears as harmful, diverting people with false hopes of heaven hereafter. Reasonable minds look to other means for survival. God is not worthy of our efforts. Finally, in Manifesto 3, humanism is a progressive th philosophy of life that without supernaturalism, read there, without God, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good of humanity. These declarations by humanism are a clear contradiction to the Bible's explicit statements concerning God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things are made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. Now, brethren, I have proven 
that they're wrong even to those who do not believe those words because I have found at least one explicit statement with found within the doctrines that they believe to be truth to be in contradiction. Therefore, since X and non-X cannot coexist together, I have found that contradiction, and therefore their premises are all false. Their foundation is destroyed by the word of God, and they therefore have no right to exist. And that's only on one point. How many others could we find and destroy? But people who are ignorant will not, in fact, understand those things. And so the Unitarian Universalist Association is built upon a truth, so-called, which has been proven conclusively here this morning to be no truth at all. I've just always had a very difficult time of believing people when they're saying very emphatically and absolutely and thus objectively that you can't be absolute, emphatic, and objective. There's just something doesn't work on that. And when they can't see it, I move to think along the lines of Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 38 when he plainly said, if any man be ignorant, let him remain ignorant. Let me go and see what that means. That means if you're unteachable and you won't be taught, you're not going to receive the absolute objective truth. You're not going to understand the laws of thought that no man invented, but they arose from the very nature of the rational powers of man. If you're not going to understand even what you are, in fact, you're, you're, in, effect, you're, you're in rebellion to your being. And it's sort of like those folks listed in Romans 1, uh, they go against nature. Well, when somebody tries to, who is an intellectual, rational person, tries to go against his, the workings, the natural workings of his um, intellect and rational powers, um, you, you have a weirdo. That's just exactly what you have. You just have a weirdo, and that's whatever you think a weirdo is. I wouldn't be too hard on you as to whatever definition you gave because there's not anyone you can give that will change a weirdo. And when you go against nature, whether it's the intellectual powers or whether it's the um, rational, they're all hooked together, of course, then there's something weird about you. Why don't you use what you are? That seems to challenge a number of us to be what we ought to be as God made us to be instead of trying to go against what we are. But there's a whole host of folks out there today who are absolutely sure you can't be absolute. And that is just the height of complete absurdity. By the way, absurdity is a good logical term. If it's not logical, it's absurd. So if you want to use it rightly, just simply say. He did a great job on that. And I, I love to hear that kind of uh, work coming from a good young man who I think evidence is not just being able to read what it says, but a command of those things, showing how it works. Let me mention this about, about some people re- hear this and they say, well, do we have to know all of that? Well, that's not the point. The point is, is that all we're doing is identifying what God put there. Uh, go, to, go to the English language, or any language for that matter, but since uh, we all speak something we call English, uh, before anybody ever classified, or first of all, ever came up with the name or the term verb, and classified what it meant to try to understand how language communicates. For anybody ever invented uh, uh, in, uh, in their mind sentence, all they're doing is trying to say, here is the way the thing operates. It's there. And thus, we're identifying it for sake of identification and uh, a definition and explanation. That's all we're doing. Nobody's invented anything. It's just simply identifying, defining, 
and classifying so you can understand that a verb was doing what a verb before anybody ever called it a verb. We just recognize it. You know, there was a time when people didn't know about an appendix. But, you know, that didn't, that didn't stop the appendix from being an appendix. And before, you know, it didn't have to know it was an appendix. I seriously doubt your appendix. You still have one. Knows it's an appendix, but uh, why do we call it an appendix? It's interesting. Words have meanings, folks. Words have meanings. And if you want to know my meaning of something, then uh, I have to know the words you use, and then I have to choose a word whereby you can understand. I watched, I mentioned the other day, this uh, debate between this uh, theist and the atheist over at the Birmingham University in Birmingham, England. I think I mentioned then that the um, atheist didn't like to use the word objective. He said there are too many definitions of it. Well, yeah, we use the word objective in a lot of different ways. But I thought the theist, he sat there and listened to him say that. And he's got a smile on his face while he listed all these different ways we use the word objective. What is your objective? Are you objective? And when the fellow got through saying why he didn't like the word objective because it had so many meanings used so many different ways, the simple answer was simply this from the theist. He said, that's the reason I defined the term as the way I would use it. That's what we all do. How am I going to understand you and you understand me if we don't use words that we define all the same way? If I call, if I'm thinking a monkey is a cow and you're thinking a cow is an elephant, I don't know how in the world we're going to have any, have any kind of a sane, intelligent conversation about monkey and elephants. Or even cows. It all works. It's not difficult. The, the difficulty comes in when we hear people start saying, well, if we're going to understand how God made us to think logically and be able to identify and use these, uh, this thing and teach it, then we have to come up with terms that represent it. So that's not inventing anything. It's simply identifying what was already there and defining it so we can communicate about it, and then we can teach people about it. And that's exactly what you do when you get into English grammar and other things. So all the terms of English grammar were invented after uh, the language was automatically there. There's a word for it. You don't see it too much anymore. If you pick up Terry's great big volume on hermeneutics, you'll run into it. Not Terry Hightower. That's the last name, Terry. Although Terry Hightower is great on hermeneutics. The last name is Terry. It was my textbook under Brother Bales, and uh, you, I don't know where you still find it. I think it may be, uh, well, it may be electronically produced now because I think it's been out of print a long time. It was this fellow wrote back in the early part of the 19th century. Big volume. But he points out uh, that certain things are coval. Now, you don't use that word coval very much. What he means by that, why that what that word actually means, is that it's the very nature of the case. I mean, wood, this bullpit's made of wood, this wood and this particular kind of wood has a certain nature that's peculiar to wood and this particular kind of wood. And that's all we're saying. Now, you don't, man doesn't invent that. He just identifies it and then uses terms so he can refer to it. And that's important to understand. We appreciate very much what you did on this particular matter.